This episode of Living Corporate is brought to you by Blind. Blind is a trusted community of more than 5 million verified professionals. On Blind, professionals connect and have honest discussions about salaries and what it's really like to work at or interview with a company. You can also join your private company channel to have a candid and safe conversation with your coworkers about what's really going on. And because it's anonymous, you can be honest and trust what you read. Check out teamblind.com to get the latest insights and the answers to your workplace questions. What's up, y'all? It's Zach with Living Corporate. And man, really interesting times and seasons that we're living in. You know, we don't really do a lot of current events on Living Corporate. Like most of our topics are evergreen. But every now and then, you know, it just so happens that I'm on Twitter or I'm looking at a headline and I just so happen to be about to, you know, record an episode. So, uh, look, I can't. <laughs> Twitter. Uh, makes for incredible content. You know, you know that we have political guests on from time to time uh, who are running for office. And you know that this election season, it's interesting because we're in a season, we continue to be in a season. And I say this as someone who's 33 years old. I'm sure that for those who are folks who are older than me, they're like, no, Zach, this is not a season. This is just the way the world works. But it's interesting. I'm, I'm noticing there are certain political candidates running for office who really have no actual ethics behind anything that they do. They have no real uh, bona fides around their leadership. They have no real qualifications to be taking up any airways <laughs> running for some type of leadership office. Uh, and yet, they are real strong candidates because they are going to fall in line with the uh, the demagogues of their larger political party. Of course, I'm talking about Herschel Walker. Um, for those who haven't been paying attention recently, and um, Herschel Walker has continued to be exposed as a hypocrite, as a fraud, as a liar. Um, but we also see in this landscape more and more that ethics really don't matter when it comes to political support, particularly in the GOP, um, and that it's really about power and control. We continue to see the GOP take on um, increasingly fascist and white supremacist platforms and ideals, um, continuing to harm, mitigate, castigate the rights and autonomy of everyone that is not a straight white man. And I'll say that I believe now more than ever, folks really are struggling to connect the, the need of ethics and leadership. And I'm really thankful for our guest today because uh, this person is a, a, a PhD in um, leadership, organizational psychology, and organizational behaviors. Uh, Dr. Lonnie Morris, who is also the host of the Access Point, um, he was able to come by. We talk a little, a lot, a bit about ethics and leadership and its connection with inclusive and equitable places to work. I think more and more organizations are going to have to be mindful of the character of their leadership, like the character profile of their leadership organization. Might does not make right. And millennials and Gen Zers are increasingly resistant to the idea of just submitting to somebody simply because they have a title listening to somebody just because they're the VP of this or the leader of that or the director of this, right? Like they just, they're not going to care. They're going to really be looking at how you behave and how you can, how you conduct yourself, right? Like that's really going to be 
the the call for leadership cultures of the future. Doing what I say just because I'm in charge, like that's just not going to work. Like we're seeing people continue to buck against these systems that uh, that that are proving themselves to be harmful and oppressive. Right. So all that being said, listen, the next thing you're going to hear, we're going to take a quick break. And after that, you're going to hear this conversation between myself and Dr. Morris. Can't wait for you to check it out. See you soon. When you're building a culture of belonging, every word counts. That's why Textio brings the world's most advanced language insights into your hiring and employer brand content. Our industry-leading approach to artificial intelligence and machine learning provides the tools needed to find more diverse candidates. In short, Textio builds more equitable workspaces, guiding businesses and writing more inclusive job posts. And we're building on that success by bringing even more products to the market for all people who share our belief that language matters. Words have power. And at Textio, we harness that power to increase the access and availability of value-driven work for everyone. Living Corporate is brought to you by Doximity. Doximity helps over 2 million medical professionals. We are the largest medical network that includes over 80% of physicians and over 50% of physician assistants and nurse practitioners. We don't take that responsibility lightly and commit it to working towards a more equitable, world inside and beyond our virtual office walls. If you want to learn more about Doximity, check out your app store at D-O-X-I-M-I-T-Y. That's D-O-X-I-M-I-T-Y. Dr. Morris, welcome back to the show. How are you doing? I'm great, man. Thank you so much for having me. This is always a pleasure. Hey, it's a pleasure uh, to have you on. You know, I want to say also, I appreciate... Uh, your brand, man, like, you know, every time I see you on IG or Twitter, you're living your best life. It's encouraging to see, um, I don't know, man, just that like academics, black folks in general, like we, we experience joy. We're not just these automatons, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think, thank you so much for saying that. And I've been very intentional about that, not just for my personal life, but also in sharing so that as you mentioned other people who have worked as hard as i have who are going through the same types of professional and family struggles that i've been through who've had the same types of journeys get to see a second part of that right that there is joy behind the scenes and i'm trying to bring it in front of the camera it's it's incredible to see it's encouraging and affirming to see um so so let's let's get right to it um you know your your background It's fairly deep, right? Like we had you on before to really talk about leadership development and the intersection of leadership and inclusion. Um, But the reality is like you've done a bunch of different things. You've got more than two decades in the game, um, you know, in this space of professional psychology uh, or or, org psychology. I'm I'm curious, like what keeps you going and motivated? I'm not calling you old, but I'm saying you've been doing (laughs) this for a while. Like what keeps what keeps you engaged in this work? Good question. I appreciate you not calling me old, but I think there's definitely value to wisdom that comes from the couple of decades of doing it. Then what keeps me going is very simple and it is uh, both encouraging and inspiring, but also sad is that people are still behaving badly in organizations. Right. It's something I still encounter regularly. My colleagues and my peers, both in academic space and professional space, still encounter it regularly. People who I get a chance to mentor encounter it regularly. My the young people in my family who are just beginning their careers saying, what is going on? Why is my boss treating me like this? Why are these people I work with acting like this? So my inspiration to continue to be involved in understanding the psyche behind people in the workplace and how do we manage that and how do we deal with that and how do we come out and show joy, as you mentioned in the beginning, in the face of that type of adversity is because it's still there. It is never going away, no matter. And we talked about this before, no matter how much we do, no matter how much we put in place, we are still challenged with the same types of organizational woes. Now, they shift at times, but my my pride in this work is helping people navigate those difficult spaces and making organizations better. 
you know, it's interesting you talk about like behaving badly. Uh, I think there's like, it's interesting, especially, you know, I'm now in this tech space and I'm noticing as you just look in, look at the headlines, see all these people getting laid off. You see uh, tech bros being complete jerks, assholes on social media. Um, And there seems to be this line between, okay, like, yeah, there are things that might be legal, but that doesn't change the fact that they are unethical. Can you like break that down a little bit around like the, the nuance between legality and uh, ethics? (laughs) Yeah, I think that's really, really great question because they're controlled by different facets of our society. And so ethics in many cases is undergirded by morals and values that are informed by culture. Your social culture might be your ethnic culture, might be your national culture, and how you are socialized in the space to appreciate and value how people engage in interpersonal relationships. Legal is controlled by, (laughs) is informed by politics in one way, right? And then is socialized over a bunch of different ways. And so that depends on if you're in a space where the circuit court judges are elected or that there are people who control how people are punished for their wrongdoing. Um, And and so all of that is shaped differently and we experience them both simultaneously and we have to navigate with what we understand about both and sometimes what we don't understand and what we notice, particularly in the legal space, maybe not just in legal, but when people know the law, We know what the law says you can do and what the law says you cannot do. But we also are very, very clear about where there's gray space. And so if it's not written specifically and explicitly that this is not okay, if your moral fabric is considerably shaky, right, then you can skirt around things that might not seem ethical to everyone. And we see bad people or good people behave badly in those ways all the time because there's not a law that says I can't do this. I can't do X, even though I can't, I cannot do Y, but doesn't say I can't do this one. Right. And so I can make a way I can create a path. And that's why we see organizations come back in the news all the time. And I I won't mention any one specifically, but there are several spaces where we see the same companies who are always in civil lawsuits. People are always bringing suits against them because of their bad behavior for creating um, fraudulent files, for treating people or mistreating people, and for breaching trust of customers. That's because it's two different sliding scopes. You know, to that end, uh, this idea, like this nuance of like, like identifying and understanding bad behavior um, especially with its correlation to what is and what is not legal. I- I'm curious, how does that inform your work as a PhD, as an educator, as a speaker, um, as a consultant? Like, how does that inform the work that you do and the and the 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 advice that you provide and the the uh, the education that you deliver? Oh, and that that's a great question, and it's an easy answer. When I first started doing work in the org development space. What I began doing was talking to entrepreneurs about how they create cultures of ethics. That was my initial activity in the space. And what they told me time and time again is, here's how I guide my behavior. I don't want my mother to see it on the news. So that's informed by both legal (laughs) aspects as well as uh, morals and values, right? So you make the right decision based on how you know the people that you love, the people that you care about, will view that in the end. And so when I'm talking to people, whether it's in the consulting space, helping people with their planning and strategic planning, leadership development, whether I'm working with new executive PhD folks who are trying to understand their organization better or their sector better, their industry better, we always start with, here's the deal. We will work hard. We will push boundaries. We will knock down ceilings and we will overcome barriers. But there's nothing that we're going to do that I will be uncomfortable with my mother seeing on the news tomorrow. That's an easy thumbprint. No, I, I hear you. Um, let's talk a little bit about, I think, like to that end, as it pertains to just professional development and 
career readiness and um, navigating and navigating the workplace, like the nuances of navigating the workplace. You and I, we connected early on through Liz. Shout out to Dr. Swigert. Um, yeah. but also like we've continued to work together. You're actually a host on the access point, which is coming back soon. Talk to me about what initially got your attention in working with and being a host, um, on the access point and what continues to, uh, to, to get, to keep you engaged or interested in, 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 uh, giving your time there. Oh, well, I guess the, the first is very easy, right? So Liz Swaggart is a, is a brilliant and a genius. And so her foresight of connecting the two of us was saying there's something here and something very special about how your professional camaraderie and relationship can grow. And then once I got exposed to all the things you're doing with Living Corporate and just been considerably and continuously impressed by not only the breadth, but the depth of your work and the people that you pull together to create all of the material in the platform for broad consumption. It's just amazing. And so having not only that as the backdrop, but I'm like you, I'm a creative. And so things come to me all the time. And when I was considering how else can I contribute, because I contribute in multiple ways to the field and to the workplace and to people as they are transitioning and thinking about all the young professionals that I've had the opportunity to mentor and then work with as colleagues. When I thought, what's the next thing? I thought, hey, maybe there's a way that we can bridge sort of what some things in my head with things that are in your head about what's going on. And when you said perhaps the access point could be a landing space for that. I thought, that's amazing, right? It is an an honor to be to be invited to be part of the Access Point and the larger living corporate community. And I just hope that my contribution there can continues to extend the work that you're doing broadly, but in particularly to help the young black and brown people as they are considering next steps in their career and sometimes in very early, early stages of what's right for me, what feels right for me, how do I answer these questions that I don't yet know that I have, how do I overcome the insurmountable pressure and challenges associated with work and career and groups and teams and planning and preparing myself for the next steps. There's nothing more exciting than being part of those conversations. So I am in constant awe and appreciate the opportunity to share that platform with not only the other host across the across the site, across the the, the universe of this discussion, but also particularly with the folks who co-host the Access Point with me. Well, again, I mean, I'm honored by that. And thank you for all your kind words. It means a lot because I know you got a lot of stuff going on. People are asking for your time. You've published several pieces and you're speaking all over the place. So um, your your willingness to be a part of um, Living Corporate's network is uh, encouraging and affirming. And um, it's just great. I don't have I don't have it. I'm trying not to turn purple over here. Bless you. Um, <laughs> but that's what I will say is, you know, we talk about the access point. For those who don't know, the access point is a show um, that is really focused on new careerists, black and brown folks really kind of having the conversations that they don't teach you in school about just navigating the workplace from like a development perspective, right? So not necessarily the technical skills of making a really good Excel document, but upward coaching or being um, being receptive to coaching or being effect, effective communicator, effective documentation, um, you know, things of that nature, identifying allies versus sponsors, things of that nature. I'm curious when you think about like this next generation of, of black and brown folks, and really you look at this moment that we're in, which is why the access point was created is because when you look at like uh, this, this season, this, this era that we're in corporate America is is experiencing the largest uh, onboarding or, um, or foray of black and brown talent, like that they've ever had, right? You think about like a lot of these folks that are coming into corporate America a lot of them are going to be first generation professionals. A lot of them are going to be second generation professionals, but there's going to be the most Gen Z is the most diverse generation. Right. And so they're coming into this space that is still largely white. 
largely male, um, lar- and then also majority millennial. Um, I'm curious, where do you, if you were to say like the top three things that Gen Z, black and brown, young professionals, early professionals need to really grasp or wrap their arms around, what would you say those things would be? Mm, that's an excellent question. And while there are some specific things that we know about Gen Z and their differences from previous generations, and there's lots, always lots of comparisons with Gen Z and and millennials, I think if I think uh, if we think about the top three things, those are typically fundamentals and they may not have come up on lists that people curate all the time. But when you look back in the history of organizations and the history of organizational behavior and the history of history of psychology in the workplace, we talk about the very same things all the time that are standards of how you interact and perform. And the first is communication. Right? And so how you communicate, and this is, it's a broader for, I think, the new generation because their socialization to communicating with each other is very different than my generation, than my parents' generation, and to some extent than the millennials. And so so this immediate gratification and how you engage with folks and I think our 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 new brothers and sisters who are coming into the workplace have some additional <clears throat> excuse me, some additional standards that they hold about how they will and won't talk to people and and express their concerns and how they'll exit not just a conversation but again the workplace and we read all these things over the past 10 to 12 months about uh new workers saying hey i finished my work at two o'clock why do i have to stay until five o'clock when your office closes or i've finished this project already do i have to continue to log into my computer for the rest of the week because these are the only things you gave me to do and so the, the first thing is about communicating your needs, your expectation, but also having the wherewithal to ask questions about needs and expectations of others and making sure that those are meshing well, that we play good in the sandbox. The second thing is, and this is something I'm finding as, as I'm watching the great resignation and then people returning as well, that we've got a lot of people in the new workforce who have opportunities in the gig economy to do things outside of work and and to move away from being an employee and be guided by those. But I, I'd say to that, there's, there's nothing wrong with that. But the skills that you need to manage within and navigate within an organization where you may be employee are the same skills you need to manage as a gig worker and an entrepreneur in that space. And so how you interact with people, how you meet expectations, how you deliver on promises, so integrity, trust, all of those things are universal across all of the workforce spaces. And the third thing is, and this is new for us, this is new for all of us, that the whole idea of the whole person matters is seen very differently in the workplace now. So we are very keen on wellness and mental health. And so younger employees are very comfortable with expressing that. And I'm excited that they are continuing to do that and push the envelope for organizations in that way. But it also means that all of the inter, all of the people that show up in your intersectionality are welcome and can be present at multiple times as you navigate an organization. And so this is an opportunity for young people to not only stand in their authenticity, but also present their multiple selves in a space and be comfortable. And if they are uncomfortable, they can hold their organization accountable for that. And we did not see that before, right? It was not okay to say, I am associated with this community or I am part of this group. And now all those things are not only relevant, but prevalent and 
on the front cover of every magazine and every newspaper. And so you can be different. We can move differently in workspaces than we did before. And that's something that I want to make sure as I talk to young people that they are not only proud of and hold dear, but also as they cherish this, that they learn the tools to do it properly. You know, Dr. Morris, one, again, it's this type of this thoughtfulness and like um, expertise that you provide, like in your answers. And when we talk about the future of work and we talk about this current landscape that excites me about the fact that you're a part of living corporate. So I just want to thank you again. Um, you know, before I let you go, I know that the access point is coming back soon. Again, I'm really excited about everything that y'all that that team is doing, that y'all are coming together. I know that that schedule is like is finalizing like as we speak. Um, but outside of the access point, what else are you excited about for the rest of this year? Mm. That's that's a good question. I have to start with you. You began our conversation talking about joy. And so I am always excited about continuing to experience joy and express that joy and share. And as you know, a lot of my joy is associated with travel and that travel is typically associated with work, right? And so that, that equation is about folding all of the things that are part of who you are and how you show up and how you like to present into a continuous experience so that I don't have to take vacation separate from work. Well, you separate the activities, right? But I get to move and move through spaces that allow me to both celebrate and experience great wellness and also accomplish great things. So in, in that regard, I've got some incredible things coming up and some opportunities to continue to engage with scholars. And I've been doing this work with the University of Bahamas for about three years now. And so I get to go down to Nassau probably four or five times a year to continue our work in documenting the injustice experiences of people in the diaspora. That's really important. And they got great beaches, right? <laughs> um, there, I've been working on probably for the last two years on this series of projects that are documenting how people experience bad leaders in the workspace. And so another project that has emerged from that is coming out in the journal later this year in the Journal of Leadership Studies. And I've been really, really intentional about this and asking people to have conversations about how they experience bad leaders in the workplace, but also to process through them. So not just for their own healing, but also for collective learning and organization development. So the more people share their stories, the more it informs what I say when I get to talk to people like you, how I respond to questions and hosts and guests that we have on the access point, how I help people who are learning to research organizations and understand the dynamics differently, how I help them figure out not only how to design the types of things they want, but also how to implement the solutions that we find. And so unpacking that layer of badness and bad behavior has been a passion project for me for the last three to four years. And so I'm always excited when something new emerges from that. And when people invite me to share what we're learning with their communities and whether that's a learning community or a professional community. And, and that keeps me going. I love it. Dr. Morris, again, always an honor and a pleasure. Excited about all the things that you're working on. Y'all make sure to click the links in the show notes to connect with Dr. Morris. Make sure y'all check out the access point coming back really soon on living corporate network. Dr. Morris, we'll be talking to you soon. I appreciate you, Zach. Peace. Peace. And we're back. Yo, shout out to Dr. Morris. Shout out to the Access Point. Shout out to y'all. Like, thank you so much for all your support of Living Corporate. I know we're coming up on the fourth quarter. I hope that you're doing something soft for yourself. I hope that you're slowing it down. I hope that you're that you're quiet quitting. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> oh, man, I'm laughing at this whole thing around quiet quitting. Like we didn't even do a whole podcast on it because I'm not trying to like give it a bunch of 
air because I think that's something like the media kind of can contemplate. Like, what is quiet quitting? Like you're doing your job or you're not doing your job, right? Like we're in this space and you're kind of seeing like certain platforms because they're plugged into and incentivized by like extremely late capitalist uh, stage structures to keep the production going. So they manufacture terms to shame people for just doing their jobs, right? Like giving people extra free work is somehow uh, seen as noble. No, it's not. That's not smart, right? Your job pays you a certain salary to do a job. Your, your job don't, you know, every two weeks, it's not like you have a, your paycheck is variable. Like most people have a, like when you have a salary job, you might, you might get any of your bonus, but you get paid to do a single job. Your, your job don't pay you above and beyond every two weeks. You get a paycheck and you know what your paycheck is going to be. You know, typically if you're going to bonus out, what that bonus is going to look like. You know what I'm saying? Anyway, my point is I hope you that you create barriers for yourself that you are, uh, if you need to be quiet quitting, I hope you're doing that. And I hope that some of you companies, I hope y'all are loudly leading. You know what I'm saying? How about that? You know what I'm saying? Stop and stop quiet firing black and brown people. How about that? Anywho, uh, until next time, y'all, <laughs> this has been Zach. I love y'all. Take care. Peace. Living Corporate is a podcast by Living Corporate LLC. Our logo was designed by David Dawkins. Our theme music was produced by Ken Brown. Additional music production by Antoine Franklin for Musical Elevation. Post-production is handled by Jeremy Jackson. Got a topic suggestion? Email us at livingcorporatepodcast at gmail.com. You can find us online on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and living-corporate.com. Thanks for listening. Stay tuned. Living Corporate is brought to you by Doximity. Over 90% of graduating medical students join Doximity to use our tools before earning their doctoral degree. As medicine's largest network, there's an elevated level of responsibility to everything we do. We don't take that responsibility lightly and are committed to working towards a more equitable world inside and beyond our virtual office walls. If you want to learn more about Doximity, make sure you go to your app store, type in D-O-X. I-M-I-T-Y. That's D-O-X-I-M-I-T-Y.